welcome back to another episode of From My Mom's Basement, the podcast recorded directly from my mom's basement. Today's episode is entitled The Crematorium, and it is written and edited by me. Thank you for listening. The first thing I noticed upon walking inside was the smell. It was that funky combination of cleansers and disinfectants found in nursing homes and public school bathrooms. The presence of these chemical aromas often means only one thing. They're being used in an effort to disguise or placate an even more offensive, foul odor. I moved through the cloud of brutal aromatics and sat down in one of the many plastic chairs that lined the waiting room. Music was playing from some undisclosed speaker in the room, which buzzed and hissed like a 1950s radio. The playlist of music was an odd mashup of antithetical tastes, bouncing from the Beach Boys to Megadeth without any warning, a musical transition so shocking it could cause whiplash. Fake plants, covered in a thin gray coating of dust, lined the perimeter of the room. Their brittle, plastic limbs rattled and waved under the AC vents. Sitting across from where I was seated was a small wooden table buried beneath a pile of faded magazines filled with images of happy, attractive people doing exciting, healthy things. I thought that was strange. Their exaggerated smiles felt almost offensive in such a dark, unhappy place. Thinking about it now, that entire lobby was a miscalculation of human psychology. It was dressed and designed in the fashion of a dentist's waiting room or a CPA's office. The vague, mundane paintings on the wall, the magazines which chronicled exciting but strictly upper-middle-class activities, and the ugly plants which surrounded the waiting room were all used in an effort to create a forgettable, unassuming environment to promote a sense of calm or serenity, or, what was most likely, a sense of nothing at all. But people weren't visiting this place for a routine checkup, or a root canal, or for help with their tax write-offs. The unfortunate visitors who entered this place, head hung and shoulders drooped, were experiencing a profound sorrow, the most magnificent despair anyone can endure in this life. Yet the casual, Norman Rockwell-lined waiting room did not accurately reflect the attitudes of the patrons who would enter it. It was almost an affront to grief itself, an insensitive design flaw that, like a maladjusted parent, acted as though sorrow and pain did not exist, and that perhaps you were flawed for suggesting that they did. To truly capture the emotion felt by the people utilizing this enterprise, the walls should have been hewn from living stone, chains should have been hung from the walls, clinking and clanking, great gears and cogs and other engines of hell should have been heard echoing from dark subterranean chambers. The place should have been lit by a series of flickering torches hung in iron sconces on the rock walls. The air should have been cold and thick with the smell of sulfur and death, and somewhere the weeping souls of the damned should have been heard moaning and wailing and screaming for mercy. But instead, I sat listening to an Alan Jackson tune while staring at a generic painting of a log cabin. It kind of felt like I was in the middle of some elaborate practical joke. How could this be a crematorium? How could, just beyond these mauve, wallpapered walls, human bodies be reduced to their fundamental elements? a pile of gray, papery carbon. At first, I almost thought I had strayed into the wrong storefront. The crematorium was, after all, operating out of a small strip mall, sandwiched between a Payless shoe source and a Chinese all-you-can-eat buffet. But when the door to the crematorium operator's office swung open, and a fat, poorly groomed woman waddled out, eyes wide like a lost child in a grocery store, I knew I was in the right place. The poor woman was trudging through a haze of misery. Each step she took required a visible amount of effort. Watching her move was like watching an inexperienced climber negotiate the summit of Mount Everest. The poor woman was learning the unhappy truth about life. Everything, especially death, costs way too much money. No matter your pain or emotional suffering, you're expected to pay up. Financial obligations are irrespective of your current trials. They have no emotional intelligence, no reverence for the bereft. Life, even in death, can find a way to slap you around and empty your pockets like a schoolyard bully. The poor woman stumbled out of the crematorium and back into the hot summer's day. A rush of hot air blew back into the waiting room and tickled my face. A tiny jingle bell, like one hanging over a dry cleaner's door, signaled her departure with a sorrowful ding, ding. It was oddly eerie. I turned away from the door to see the proprietor of the crematorium leaning against the doorframe to his office. He was shaking his head like a disappointed parent. Widows, he said, they're all the same. They act like they're the only ones in the history of the universe whose husband has died. 
I've met with four of them already this morning. Yeesh. The proprietor looked nothing like how I imagined him. The image I had created in my mind of a crematorium operator, that of an old man with a skeletal frame, a long hooked nose, grayish complexion, and deep-set eyes, was completely destroyed and proving inaccurate. The man standing in the doorway was a stout, greasy-looking character with thick, slicked-back hair, a wispy mustache, and curly chest hair that sprung out of his polo shirt. He looked more equipped to sell you a used Buick than to incinerate your grandma. "'You the kid looking for a job?' he asked, fiddling with the gold chains on his wrist. Uh, "'Yes, sir,' I said, standing up from my rickety plastic chair. "'I, uh, I send in my application online?' "'Uh-huh,' he said, gurgling up some phlegm. "'Why don't I, uh, I show you around the place? Yeah?' I nodded. "'Okay,' I said. I'd, "'I'd love to see it all.' The proprietor nodded and walked across the lobby where, to my surprise, there was a giant, pale gray door which looked as though it had been used in a military-grade bomb shelter. It had thick hinges as long as ten-penny nails and a small peephole in its center. The mustachioed proprietor had to use three different keys and a numeric code in order to unlock the heavy door, which was probably as thick as two phone books taped together. Once the door was open, the proprietor grabbed me by the shoulder and led me inside. It was so dim on the other side of the threshold that my eyes took a few seconds to acclimate to the murky darkness. I saw greenish fuzzies. But once they finally adjusted, I was again met with something I didn't expect. I had previously imagined the crematoria to be a kind of clinical, sterile environment akin to a high-tech research laboratory or a science fiction space station. The cremator would be the centerpiece of this edifice, surrounded by white walls, chrome machinery, and accoutrements, and workers dressed in heavily starched white smocks. All of this would be lit beneath bright but cold lights. This dream, however, would have to remain in my imagination, for the actual crematoria was beyond what my own worst nightmares could have produced. As I walked into the crematorium, I was immediately introduced to the smell that had been disguised by that cocktail of cleansers. It was the smell of fiery death, the smell of burnt hair and smoking skin. The room itself had an industrial or functional quality like that of a warehouse or factory floor and was dimly lit by a series of dangling incandescent light bulbs, the kind you might find in a cellar or attic. There were wooden workbenches lining the crematorium, which housed various apparatus made to aid in the process of carbonization. In the very center of the dark room stood, like a brick oven in a pizzeria, the centerpiece of the crematorium, the furnace itself. It was a black, soot-coated cremator which seemed to ooze with a caustic stink that burned the back of my throat like vomit or hard liquor. And as I peered around the room, I began to notice a thin film of ash coating everything like a city after a nearby volcanic eruption. The floor itself was like the chalky surface of the moon. Every step I took made a vivid imprint in the soft, ashy deposits that had collected from years of bodily incineration. Standing across the room, at the mouth of the furnace, peering into what looked like a porthole in its front, was a skinny man with hollow cheeks. He resembled a Victorian chimney sweep, his face covered in soot and his body displaying all of the recognizable signs of malnourishment. I stood still, absorbing all of the horror like a tween in a haunted attraction, terrified of what might be lurking around the next corner. I jumped when the large metal door slammed shut behind me with a loud, ominous clang. I could hear the proprietor approaching from behind me. His fat hand clapped me on the back, and he said, This is it. This is the place where the magic happens. It looks like Peter is just finishing up with somebody right now. Good. We can watch. The boss led me over to the dusty man operating the furnace and introduced us. The soot-covered man told me his name was Peter and violently shook my hand, leaving me with a palm full of human ash. Peter here has been working with me for years, the proprietor said with an obvious air of pride. He's the best in the business. He can take a body from flesh and bone to dust in a blink of an eye. Peter nodded, a grim smile spreading on his face. Now, the proprietor said, something to know about this furnace here. She's one hell of a machine, hot as the depths of hell. But it's an animal furnace. It's designed for, uh, for yuppies who want their dog or cat cremated and set on the mantelpiece, you see. It's considerably smaller than a furnace designed for human remains, but also considerably cheaper. You understand? This way we can charge much less than our competitors who try to play their operation above board. State protocols insist that you use human-sized furnaces for human-sized remains, but what the hell's the point in that? 
I mean, seriously, what kind of dumb mandate is that? Who cares if you need to twist some necks or snap some legs to get them to fit in? They're going to be a pile of smoking dust in a matter of moments, right? I mean, what, what in the hell kind of dumbass law is that? I remained silent. I was trying to conceal my horror like a captive in a hostage situation, afraid to escalate the scenario by expressing any kind of disgust or fear. The proprietor pressed his beady eyes against the little foggy porthole in the furnace and peered inside its fiery hole. Ah, uh, the proprietor said, this cookie is just about crisp. Bring over the trash bin, Petey boy. I watched as Pete lugged over a simple metal trash bin and set it below the mouth of the furnace. Then, the proprietor, after switching off an array of knobs and switches, unlatched the furnace door. A toxic, billowing cloud of human vapor crawled out of the furnace like a malevolent apparition and slithered into the air, filling the room with a dense fog of human flesh particulate. That was when I got my first glimpse of the furnace's interior. It was essentially a long, dark tube filled with metal grating and what appeared to be a row of nozzles resembling common sprinkler heads. I suppose that it was through these nozzles that white-hot jets of flame shot out, reducing the body to a flaming heap of crust particles in a matter of minutes. I squinched my eyes and closed my mouth, hoping not to ingest any of the fumes that were filling the furnace room. The proprietor donned some latex gloves and reached into the mouth of the furnace like a dairy farmer doing a preg check on an enormous bovine. He came away from the furnace with two large handfuls of dry, flaky ash in his hands. He brought his nose close to the ash, smelled it, and then tossed it all into the metal trash bin. This is a funky smelling one today, the proprietor said. Hopefully the boys over at Mandarin Buffet don't give us an earful. We have a standing deal with those fellas. As long as we do our cooking during their off hours, we get free Kung Pao chicken. How about that? What? Wh wh why are you throwing the ashes away? I asked, failing to hide my complete disgust. The proprietor looked to Pete, who, as if on cue, began to laugh in a high-pitched backwoods kind of way. His nostrils flared and his rotten teeth revealed in a wide, dopey smile. The proprietor let out a couple of chuckles himself and then clapped his latex-covered hands over the garbage bin like a couple of chalkboard erasers. Dust rose up into the air and faded into the general haze of the crematorium. Why, the proprietor began, we never give our customers actual human ash. Just think about how unsanitary that would be. Ugh. But more importantly, just think about how bland and unattractive actual human ash is. It's so unappealing. It's no more beautiful than common campfire ash or fireplace soot. Where is the art in that? The creativity? Here, my friend, we are artisans. We create. We concoct our own ash using gravel found from the lot out back and other powders and minerals of varying textures, gradients, sizes, and hues. We decide how the dead are remembered. We are the manipulators of eternity. They were completely serious. No smiles, no hidden laughter, only flat, stoic faces. I kept waiting for a camera crew to explode from a hidden corner to tell me that this was all some prank. But this kind of morbid scenario was far beyond what a team of TV writers could conjure. Its bleak absurdity would be too extreme for even the most alternative audience to enjoy. Come on, Pete the proprietor said, tossing the lid of the trash bin back on with a clang. Let's show the rookie here how it's done. The two men led me to a work table, much like something you would find in an artist's studio or Santa's workshop. Tools and receptacles of all shapes and sizes lined the desk. There were tubs filled with rice, metal pails full of crushed white chalk, a lunch tin filled with small gravel rocks, an old water bottle labeled beach sand, a pink pencil case filled with what looked like lint from a dryer filter, and many other granular and powdery objects taken from parts unknown. These were all the ingredients necessary to create some kind of human ash substitute or facsimile, except the main goal here was not to accurately replicate the true appearance of human ash, but to dramatize it, to exaggerate and modify it, to create something worthy of lasting memory. Once all three of us were standing before the table, Peter retrieved a small cardboard box and began to scour the table for the proper ingredients needed to create his human ash surrogate. First, a dash of ground pepper went into the box, then a handful of cumin, then a sprinkling of brown sugar, and so on, and so forth. You see, the proprietor said, his eyes fixed on the mixing operation commencing before him, one must have an intuitive capacity for this work. A subtlety and an instinct must be employed. True artistry must be your ideal. 
For example, it looks as though Peter believes that these ashes will be sprinkled rather than kept in an urn. This is an important quality to intuit, for it will affect the entirety of your creation. Watch. The substances Pete is using indicate his prediction of sprinkling. If you look, you can see that he is using lightweight, powdery materials with intense, contrasting colors that, when sprinkled, will create a vibrant, high-flying plume that will aerosolize rather easily and gingerly, giving the funeral party an almost pyrotechnical experience. Now, say he was expecting the ash to be kept in an urn, he would likely go with some heavy textures with deep earth tones, something that might make the ash feel more substantial, more robust. While the proprietor continued to drone on about proper ash mixing techniques, I began looking for a way to escape the fume-filled dungeon. I ran my eyes around the crematorium and saw, across the room, a small door painted in blood-red paint. It had a chrome tumbler in its center like a door to a bank vault. I suppose that that would be my exit, my escape. I shifted my weight in preparation for my flight, silently pivoting towards the red door, hoping that the proprietor and Peter wouldn't notice. I prepared to run, to escape from the smoke-ridden sample of hell itself, when a knock came from the very door I was going to run towards. It was a serious, swift knock that demanded expediency from the occupants on the other side of the door. The proprietor cut his lecture short and turned towards the red door with a smile. You hear that, Pete? The proprietor said. Sounds like we have a delivery. Peter nodded, still entirely invested in his task, mixing different ingredients like a culinary artist at a five-star restaurant. The proprietor strode across the room towards the red door, his feet brushing through the flesh dust that coated the floor, tossing little clouds of dust into the air. Then, with an audible exertion of force, the proprietor cranked the tumbler around and swung open the heavy door. Standing on the other side of the threshold was an old man hunched over a gurney. On top of the gurney was, as I'm sure you could have guessed, a black body bag which bowled at odd locations and angles. Thanks, Gus, the proprietor said. We'll take it from here. The proprietor slid the body bag off the gurney and let it slam to the ground like a pile of wet laundry. It hit the floor with a haunting, squishy thud. Once it was on the ground, the proprietor kicked the bag like a soccer ball into the crematorium and slammed the red door closed behind him. All right, Pete, the proprietor called. Come help me move this son of a bitch. Peter dropped what he was doing and the two men carried the dead body across the room with vacant, unaffected expressions. These men had a cruel apathy and indifference in the face of death, a kind of emotional disconnection that could only be created from years of torching human flesh to smithereens. I watched the proceedings happening in front of me like a defendant in a murder trial, hopeless to do anything. They brought the body back to the mouth of the furnace and plopped it onto the dusty floor, ejecting a fine amount of ash into the air. The proprietor unzipped the body bag with a quick flick of his arm and said, Ooh, doggies. This old hag's got to be close to a million years old. Look at that, Petey. She's got wrinkles on her wrinkles. Yeesh. Pete swung the furnace hatch wide open without a word, and they exhumed the old woman's body from her polyurethane cocoon. The bag made a sick, wrinkling noise as they tore her from the synthetic sleeve. The old woman's body was, indeed, very wrinkly. It was nothing more than a saggy drapery of skin and fat hung over small and fragile bones. Careful stuffing her in here, Pete, the proprietor said, huffing and puffing as they stuck the old lady inside the furnace. We don't want her to burst open and spill out everywhere. That'd be a mess to clean. Just be very careful now. Her skin's about as thin and brittle as wet tin foil. Peter nodded. Meanwhile, I stood back and watched and thought. I thought about who this woman had been. Was she a mother, a grandmother, an intellectual, a blue-collar worker, a staunch Muslim, a fierce atheist, a casual joker, a stone-cold woman lacking an ounce of humor or wit? An entire life had been carried out through that vessel of musculature and bone, a generation witnessed and experienced through those eyes. What had her old, wrinkly hands done? What had they made? What had they comforted? Had they toyed with microscopes, coddled children, performed open-heart surgery, dissected animals, weaved intricate tapestries? What about her milky eyes? What secrets had they been privy to? What beautiful landscapes had they taken in? What sunrises? What sunsets? What about her old ears brimming with white hairs and riddled with purple nodules? What wonderful sounds had they heard? The laughter of newlyweds? the crying of a newborn, the song of a blue jay, the sound of wind through autumn leaves. This woman's life, 
the accumulation of all things experienced, the aggregation of the good, the blessed, the terrible, and the painful, had been confronted in this body, in this saggy bag of flesh and bones that was getting squeezed into an animal furnace like the last suitcase on a greyhound bus. An entire life experience was navigated with that amalgamation of organic material. An entire cosmos was learned of, an entire universe was discovered through that simple physical form. Museums should have been dedicated to her body, statues erected, poems sung, anything to actually represent what this body meant. And what it meant was this. Through that clumsy body, an empire as great as Rome had risen and fell. A story as intricate as any great novel or drama had been carried out and taken to its terminus. And a wonder as great as the Colossus of Rhodes and divine as any celestial body in the night sky had been born and extinguished. Yet Peter and the proprietor didn't seem to be affected by this notion. They were busy prodding and squishing and folding the body up like she was a pile of dirty laundry getting stuffed into a washing machine. They folded her corpulent legs up against her chin and squeezed her rolls of fat against the ash-encrusted sides of the oven. All of this squishing and stuffing made horrific slimy sounds like wet flatulence. Once they successfully squished the entirety of her bulky remains into the furnace, they slammed the hat shut and stepped away from the cremator. All righty, the proprietor said, let's torch this old broad. Peter bent over below the furnace and twisted a knob which was connected to a propane cylinder, much like those blue rhino ones you can buy at a hardware store. While Peter prepped the furnace, the proprietor walked back to where I was standing, a mischievous grin on his face. This will be good for you to see, he said. Something you should know, the fatties actually burn faster than the little guys. I know. I know, it's weird because there's a lot more of them to burn, but the oil in their fat kind of creates a grease fire. And once that spreads, whoosh, the whole body goes up. So you'll want to adjust the flames accordingly. Okay, Petey, go ahead. I slowly backed away from the furnace and shielded my eyes as if I was about to witness a nuclear detonation. There was a brief moment of silence, and then a high-pitched whooshing noise like a fast-moving wind. Suddenly, the little porthole in the furnace lit up with a brilliant light like an arc welder's torch, and I could begin to smell the old woman's flesh turning into a pile of charcoal briquettes. I couldn't watch. I couldn't breathe. I was sick to my stomach. I lowered my head and continued to back away from the furnace until I felt my back press up against the far wall. A thick, sulfuric smell entered my nostrils and made my eyes water. I coughed violently. And then, suddenly, like a car sputtering out of gas... The whooshing sound ceased and the brilliant light faded to darkness. What in the hell? The proprietor mumbled to himself. I looked up to see Peter and the proprietor looking over the various instruments of the incinerator like dim-witted car mechanics, making uneducated conjectures about the source of the mechanical failure. Wait, boss, Peter said. I think it's the fuel. I think we're just out of fuel here, see? The proprietor nodded and looked into the little porthole. Woo-wee, he shouted. We got ourselves a half-cooked chicken in there, sonny. Poor thing looks like one of those half-crusty, half-goopy boogers you get way up in your nose. The proprietor turned around to face me. My eyes were still watering, but not from the acrid odor. They were tears of fear and sorrow. A new guy, the proprietor said. You mind making a run to Home Depot and snagging us a propane tank? The greasy boss walked up to me and slapped some crinkled dollar bills in my powder-filled palm. I hung my head to hide my tears and gladly accepted the errand without any intention of returning. I just needed an excuse to get the hell out of there as soon as possible. If it hadn't been for the empty propane tank, I think I might have resorted to violence. The proprietor opened the thick steel door and I lunged, gasping for fresh air, back into the lobby. A white snake song was blaring from the hissing speaker and the sun scorched my eyes. I felt like a medieval prisoner having just escaped from a torture chamber. Without looking back, I tossed the crumpled dollar bills on the floor and ran outside the crematorium. I stood on the curb of the strip mall and dry heaved while the appetizing yet horrific smell of Kung Pao chicken and burnt flesh choked the back of my throat. Thank you for listening. That was The Crematorium. This episode was written, edited, and produced by me. And the music was provided by Kevin McLeod. Thank you again.